Um, when I was, um, I mean, I, I do this more in detail in, in the book, but I'm trying to connect dots here. What I came across when I was putting all this together, again, was something I've termed the moon matrix. The first section today is absolutely crucial to understanding how this can work. The moon matrix is a broadcast frequency coming from the moon which has in effect um, hacked in to the human body computer and to the virtual reality universe in general and has created a sub-reality within the wider virtual reality. Because, I keep saying it, but it's important, we see the moon as physical, but actually its base construct, like everything else in this reality, is waveform information. And I s would say, and of course I think this is going to become more obvious as, as, as the years pass, I would say the moon is actually not just what we've talked about so far, but it's an interdimensional portal through which entities and energies can come out of one reality through into this one. It's their means of entry. Its position, so perfect, as you'll see if you, if you read not just my new book, but Who Built the Moon, um, its position in relation to the moon and the sun is so perfect because that has an effect on creating this sub-reality. I'm saying that this frequency is broadcast from the moon and has created a sub-reality which we are constantly decoding and that the genetic manipulation of humanity so widely described by the ancients was to take this body computer and tune it in, connect it to this frequency range I'm calling the moon matrix. This is uh, Neil Haig's concept of moonopoly. This is the world, the structure that we are experiencing. This box recurring round and round limited world. And I am suggesting that we are being massively influenced. In fact, we have been turned into a hive mind by these broadcasts which are holding us in a sense of limitation to the point where it operates as a default mechanism. Soon as you start to awaken, if you don't keep it going and, 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 and stick with it, then you'll default back because the pressure of this moon matrix is pushing us into this uh, tiny sense of um, limitation. So what virtual realities do is they basically hijack the five senses and get them to decode the information in the computer game and take it into reality. I'm saying that this moon matrix has done exactly the same and it is part of the modus operandi of how planets are taken over in this way. Our five senses have been locked into something else and we're decoding a fake reality. Basically, we are um, connected to this symbolically, which is a hive mind, uh, which is why we are so herd-like when we weren't before. Uh, you know, and if people are going, well, okay, what, what, just stick with me, because the, the layers will go on. What, um, what I've been talking about today is the fact that this base vibration from the black holes uh, goes through this cycle, and it elicits different information in the form of photons from the suns, which we decode, and the reality changes. We go through different epochs. What I'm saying is that this moon matrix has hacked in to that photon energy um, stream and has done what the Chinese authorities have done uh, to the computer system in China, they have stopped us accessing vast amounts of the virtual reality universe that we used to uh, before. Now, if anyone thinks this is fantastic, that, that we could see things that aren't really there and not see things that aren't there, this is a new scientist. America has just switched from analog to digital television. In the short time of about a year that the analog uh, frequencies are not being accessed because they're going to be filled up by other things like mobile phones, suddenly, for the first time, scientists can see and connect with radio waves from galaxies they couldn't before. Why couldn't they do it before? Because we were watching the flipping telly. Prior to the switchover in America, 
naturally occurring radio waves at frequencies between 700 and 800 megahertz were obscured by analog TV signals, preventing astronomers from investigating the universe using this band. The freeing up of this bandwidth is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to see galaxies in this range. Now, you imagine what is capable by these, this high technology in blocking frequencies so we can't perceive what's there and we perceive things that aren't there. That's what this is doing, I suggest. And I'll add more detail as we go along. In effect, we're operating within a bubble, a virtual reality bubble, within the wider virtual reality universe. And it's connecting in through our crystalline receiver transmission system, same with the Earth, and creating this situation where we are decoding a world that may be even not be there, who knows, but certainly is different to the world we think it is. And we go back to this more accurately now. The matrix, I would say the moon matrix, is everywhere. It is all around us, even now in this very room. You can see it when you look out of your window and you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. It is the world that, world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. What truth? You are a slave, Neo. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage, born into a prison. You cannot smell, taste, or touch a prison for your mind. I would say that prison for your mind is the moon matrix, we, which has put us in a vibrational prison that we can only break out of by becoming conscious and therefore vibrating beyond the walls of the moon matrix, which is a frequency range. And if we're not held in that frequency range, that's why society is structured as it is, with its stress and its fear and its war and its conflict, then we start to break out of its perception prison and we start to say, bloody hell, why didn't I see this before? Because you were there, constantly decoding this thing. Now, like I was just saying, never mind what I've just said about some moon matrix, never mind that. Even by its very position, the moon is fundamentally affecting human behavior and human perception. Because the moon is affecting the Earth uh, tilt, the Earth's spin, it's affecting the Earth oceans, therefore it's affecting us. We're 60, 70 percent water, we must be affected by it. And also, and here we come back to the importance of the first section today, it's also fundamentally affecting the um, endocrine system, which connects us to the chakra system, which connects us to out there, part of which is the third eye. It affects the, the hormones that we secrete. And which fundamentally affect human behavior, human health, human perception. Not with any matrix, just by being there. And it fundamentally affects this, the uh, pituitary and the pineal gland that give us the sixth sense ability to see beyond the five senses. And what it has done, it has shut down in so many people, on purpose, the third eye, which in our previous pre-domination mode, we used to perceive vast areas of reality beyond what, which, we, uh, which we can now. Moonth comes from moon. The moon, of course, as it goes around, fundamentally affects our perception of time. We have moonths because of the moon. It's a moonarchy. It's a hybrid moonarchy, monarchy. And one of the major ways they control us, seems to be a modus operandi again, is moony, money. Controlled by the Rothschilds. Now, I saw a movie, film, <laughs> some years ago, <laughs> called They Live. It was a B-movie, and it was not just produced and directed, he wrote the music, every bloody thing, by a guy called John Carpenter. You follow John Carpenter's uh, movie-making history, and you will see that he's, he bloody knows a great deal. He'll say he doesn't, he bloody knows a great deal. He, he, he does movies and horrors and Satanism and all this stuff, and he did this movie called They Live, and I, I thought it was very symbolically accurate when I first saw it, but now it's unbelievably accurate. For those who haven't seen it, you go on YouTube, put John Carpenter, they live in, you can see it in sections still today. The story was this, it was set in the future, but the future was about now, because it was a few years ago now. There was a massive economic depression, and this guy comes along uh, with his tools on his back, he's walking around America trying to find a job in the building industry. He gets a, a, a one, a short term one at this building site. Um, at the end of the day, one of the, one of the uh, other builders said, do you have anywhere to stay? Because there's a ma massive economic depression. People are living in tents, cities, and corrugated iron um, uh, makeshift uh, villages on wasteland. Exactly what's happening in America now, incidentally. 
and he's now having nowhere to stay. So anyway, he goes back with him to stay at this corrugated iron tent little village thing on, on, a, on the wasteland. And he starts getting interested because there's things going on across the church, across the way that seem very strange to him. And the, the, the village has mocked up some kind of uh, television uh, in, a, in a kind of Heath Robinson way. And when they're watching the television, suddenly it breaks out of the main channel and there's just a man's face on the screen saying, they're here, they're controlling, you don't know, they, all that stuff. And then there's a, there's a police state raid on this village and on this church. And they, they bring the bulldozers in and the police and the helicopters and they, they destroy the village. And this builder guy gets away and he comes back and he goes snooping around the church and he finds some uh, cardboard boxes. And uh, he grabs one um, and, and runs into a, a, a back back uh, uh, passage uh, behind buildings and he opens the box wondering what's in it and there's sunglasses and he's disappointed sunglasses what are these sunglasses in a church for so he thinks oh, I'll have one he puts them in his pocket throws the others away walks off into the street and that's where we pick him up when he puts these sunglasses on suddenly the world looks very very different it looks like this he starts to realize that there are people that look human to his naked eye that are anything but human when he puts these sunglasses on. Not only that, where he's seeing adverts with his naked eye, drink Coca-Cola, holiday in Jamaica or whatever, what he can see with the glasses on is subliminal instructions, conform, stay asleep, consume, watch TV, submit, and all the rest of it. All on levels that he can't see. Other people who haven't got the glasses, they're interacting with various people, but he can see are not human. He looks at the president making a speech. He's not human when he looks at him through the glasses. Same with a number of people in law enforcement. Uh, news readers were the same. And the, where, it, where it goes is that at the end of the movie, they realize that the reason that people cannot see without the glasses, um, what he can see is because there is a frequency being transmitted from the top of a television tower which is pre preventing the population seeing what they would normally see if that frequency wasn't being broadcast. And what they do is they break the, the broadcast frequency, they, 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 they stop the dish working, and people are sitting in bars, and suddenly they can now see the guy next to them is not human. What a bloody laugh that would be, wouldn't it? And there's people out having sex and then realizing, hey, I, I didn't really come home with you. Tell you the funny thing, a lady in Canada told me this t story happened to her. I spoke in Canada years ago now, and I met this lady. She was a, a, a power-dressing businesswoman, you know, very of this world. But she'd had this experience, and she was shaking when she told me the story. Um, she said that um, she got this, this, this boyfriend who had a dark side, she said, who, that he, he, he knew about and he was trying to deal with. And they come home, and they go into the bedroom, and there was a... There was a a shelf at the top of her bed, and standing there was the book, The Biggest Secret, which for the first time I introduced this reptilian thing. He then goes crazy, she said, when he sees the book, and he, he got her to throw it away. Oh, what are you reading that rubbish for, and all that stuff? Mind you, he's not alone in that. Um, and then they start having sex, and he, he's kind of on top of her, and she said, I had my hand on the, the bottom of his back, and suddenly he started getting very, very violent, and I started getting frightened. And she said, then I, I, my hand was pushed back. And she said, I looked over his shoulder, and, and my hand had been pushed back by a tail. He sprouted a tail. She said, I screamed, threw him off, and he, for a second or two in front of me, he was totally reptilian, and then morphed back to human, and ran out of the house, never seen him again. But these bizarre stories um, that are bizarre to our reality, I've been told all over the world by people from all different walks of life, people in the Swiss banking system and all that stuff, all different kinds of people. So um, this frequency is that equivalent of that broadcast dish on the top of that TV tower, which was stopping those people in that movie seeing what they would normally see. Now, when we bring this down into the reptilian world, well, it gets interesting because we live in a society that is a expression of the reptilian brain. This man, Carl Sagan, a cosmologist, very famous, he wrote a book called The Dragons of Eden, in which he was looking at the effect of reptilian genetics on human behavior. 
And he uh, said, you cannot, in effect, understand human behavior without understanding the reptilian aspect of, of, of all this. And we come back to what I mentioned earlier. This part of the brain, known as the reptilian brain or the R complex to scientists, is so fundamental to human behavior, as, as I'll explain in a second. And I'm saying that this genetic manipulation that the ancients talk about is all over the world by the serpent gods locked us in to the moon matrix through the reptilian brain because it connects into the hive mind of the reptilian species in the moon. And this, like I say, fundamentally expresses itself as the world um, that we live in. And I'll, I'll come to that more in a second. Now, in the 60s, around that time, there's a guy called Carlos Castaneda who wrote books based on the teachings uh, of, a, of a Central American shaman source called Don Juan Matos. Um, some people say Don Juan didn't exist. Some people say he did. Whatever, the words that were put into his mouth are just absolutely extreme, extraordinarily accurate. And I read this quote coming up after I put this stuff together that I've been talking about. Um, this is what Don Juan Matus said in, in these books. We have a predator that came from the depth of the cosmos and took over the rule of our lives. Human beings and its prison, are its prisoners. The predator is our lord and master. It has rendered us docile, helpless. If we want to protest, it suppresses our protest. If we want to act independently, it demands that we don't do so. Indeed, we are held prisoner. They took us over because we are food to them, and they squeeze us mercilessly because we are their sustenance. Just as we rear chickens in coops, the predators rear us in human coops, human eros. Therefore, their food is always available to them. Think for a moment and tell me how you would explain the contradictions between the intelligence of man the engineer and the stupidity of his systems of belief or the stupidity of his contradictory behavior. Sorcerers believe that the predators have given us our systems of beliefs, our ideas of good and evil, our social mores. They are the ones who set up our dreams of success or failure. They have given us covetedness, greed, and cowardice. It is the predator who makes us complacent, routinary, and egomanical. In order to keep us obedient and meek and weak, the predators have engaged themselves in a stupendous maneuver. Stupendous, of course, from the point of view of a fighting strategist, a horrendous maneuver from the point of those who suffer it. They gave us their mind. The predator's mind is baroque, contradictory, morose, filled with the fear of being discovered any minute now. They gave us their mind. And that is how I suggest they've done it. We are connected if we operate within the hive reptilian brain mind. We are operating on a collective mind, which is pouring out this constant sense of anxiety, fear, worry, stress, because that a, keeps us within the confines of the frequency range of the moon matrix, i.e. attached to it, and it also um, elicits the emotional, low vibrational energy on which they feed. Behind all these pyramids of banking, medicine, religion, business, politics, is the reptilian hive mind. It connects into all these control systems that run our society. And now let's look at the character traits of the reptilian brain. Is this our society or what? This is mainstream science, by the way. From the reptilian brain, we get primitive and emotional responses. Cold-blooded behavior, lack of empathy, if not balanced out by other parts of the brain. And territoriality, this is mine, get out. A desire to control, an obsession with hierarchical structures of power. Aggression, might is right, winner takes all. And it is dominating our sense of reality and our reaction and responses to events and other people. This is the word that sums up the reptilian brain. Survive, survival. It doesn't think, it hasn't got the ability to think, it reacts. 
That's why it can react so fast. There are good things about it. When you're driving along in your car and someone walks in front of you, what rams the anchors on immediately without thinking instantly is the reptilian brain. But when that starts to impact on other parts of our behavior and our lives, then it becomes a very negative thing indeed. It is the reptilian brain and its fear of not surviving. It's always scanning the environment for threats. Not just physical threats, but threats on other, in, in other levels of, of our um, experience, which I'll, which I'll uh, explain in a second. And therefore, the targeting of the reptilian brain and the constant triggering it, of, of it is what gives us this constant fear, this constant stress, worry that goes on in all areas of our lives. Will I meet the rent at the end of the month? Oh my God, will I lose my job? Oh my God. And the more that we can be put in fear, here we go, the more we operate in the reptilian brain. That's why we're constantly given reasons to fear and to be anxious. Be afraid, be very afraid. The big bag monster's coming as soon as we've invented him. And when he's gone, we'll have another. Terrorism, ah! Global warming, ah! Swine flu, ah! The economy, ah! I don't look like her, ah! I don't look like him, ah! Constant, constant reasons to fear. <laughs> Locking us into the control system. And it's not just physical survival. It's survival of status, of power, of reputation, superiority, intellectual preeminence, acquiescence to a hierarchy and authority is another aspect of the reptilian brain. I know my place. And you know, when, 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 when you put information out that challenges the, 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 the status quo view of scientists and academics, they react vehemently. Why? Because the reptilian brain's kicked in. Survival of their reputation, survival of their belief system. When you uh, put out information that challenges people's religious beliefs, not you're saying you're wrong and all that stuff, you're just saying here's some information, which if it's true, that, 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 that can't, be, can't be right. They vehemently attack you. Why? Because the reptilian brain's kicked in, because the belief system is uh, in danger of not surviving. Uh, fear of money. Money is uh, fundamentally reptilian brain. Uh, two, two polarities of it. One, fear of not surviving, fear of not having enough to pay the rent, to eat. And on the other hand, you can get so locked into the reptilian brain, and this is what the, um, the hybrid bloodlines do, that you equate survival with far more than is necessary to survive. So you get people, especially in these bloodline networks, who have got more money than they could spend in a hundred lifetimes, but they get up with the sun every morning to go and earn bloody more. It's an obsession, it's an addiction, and it's connected to the reptilian brain, which fundamentally drives our perception of reality. Don Juan Matus again. I know that even now, though you never have suffered hunger, you have hunger and food anxiety which is none other than the anxiety of the predator who fears that at any moment now its maneuver is going to be uncovered and food is going to be denied. Through the mind, which after all is their mind, the predators inject into the lives of human beings whatever is convenient for them and they ensure in this manner a degree of security to act as a buffer against this fear. Sorcerers of ancient Mexico reasoned here we go that man must have been a complete being at one point, with stupendous insights, feats of awareness, that are mythological legends nowadays. And then everything seems to disappear, and we now have a sedated man. What I'm saying is, what we have against us is not a simple predator. It is very smart and organized. It follows a methodical system to render us useless, modus operandi, done it many times. Man, the magical being that he is destined to be, He's no longer magical. He is an average piece of meat. There are no more dreams for man, but the dreams of an animal who is being raised to be a piece of meat, trite, conventional, imbecilic. This is what becoming conscious brings us out of. Control of perception is the bottom line of this conspiracy. You know, I'm all for exposing 
9-11s and banking scams and not engineered wars, but this is the bottom line. And if we miss it, then we're going round in circles and we'll get nowhere. Interestingly, the Zulu legends say that before the moon came, they used to worship the sun as female. And then everything changed. This change from perceiving the sun as female to worshipping it as male made possible the creation of warlike kings that took what they wanted by force. Everything changed when the perception of the sun changed. And the perception of the sun changed when the moon matrix kicked in and changed our perception of everything. And in so many ways, this Avatar movie, I'm not saying Cameron symbolized it like this, I'm saying what it symbolized to me. The blue people who were in total harmony with everything else, I'm saying to me, are symbolic of humans as we were before the predator came. And then the American troops with their high technology, let's kill people, we want these resources, so let's just go and get them and destroy everything to do so. They symbolize to me this reptilian intervention. And they even have in the Avatar movie, of course, the concept of the possession of the blue people so that they could infiltrate their society while outwardly looking like they do and not being uh, known to be who they are. These reptilians look down a different timeline to us because they're, they're on a different wavelength. They're able to see further into what we call the future than we are. And therefore, if you access this network of secret societies, especially the inner circle, you can access the projected future of human society which this is planning. Therefore, you can write prophetic novels which further down what we call the timeline turn out to be staggeringly accurate. All you need to do is to access that projection. And you do it by accessing the secret society network. This, the Fabian Society in London, created in 1884, is one of those societies. It, the deeper inner core that have access to that timeline and that projected agenda. And this guy was one of them, a Fabian. And that's the Fabian logo, by the way. The wolf in sheep's clothing. Perfect. Perfect. It created, in effect, the Labour Party in Britain, and it influences uh, massively uh, the, the left, not only the left, but what we call the left centre of politics, not just in Britain, but in other countries. Australia too, for instance, very, very powerfully. When people have said to me in the past, you know, what, what's planned, I've said to them, well, you can read two books and see it, just put them together. George Orwell's 1984 and Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. This was uh, published in 1948, this was in 1932. Uh, put the two together, this talks about the drugs and, and, and all the rest of it, and the mind control, this talks about the, the sort of police state. Put them together, you got it. They were incredibly prophetic. I've been saying for years they weren't novels, or that their source wasn't novels. Turns out that Aldous Huxley taught French to a man called Eric Blair then, now uh, George Orwell, at Eton College, and introduced him to the Fabian Society. And this was the knowledge base, plus no doubt others connected, where they got their, these, these concepts. And uh, what they said all those decades ago, Oxley's uh, case 1932, is now happening in incredible detail. And it seems that Orwell rebelled against what he heard and wrote 1984 to try to expose it, uh, and some researchers suggest, they may well be right, that he called it 1984 when it was set kind of about now um, because 1984 was the 100th anniversary of the creation of the Fabian Society. We've reached a point where these entities and their hybrid bloodlines, the Illuminati bloodlines, they think the takeover of humanity is almost complete. And when you look at it, it may seem to be that that's the case. They think the game is over. It's gone so far. They must be bloody joking. These people... <laughs> These people are in for the shock of their lives in the next few years. The shock of their lives. 
because they can access so much, but they can't access beyond that. And they think the game's over because it seems to be here, but they can't perceive there. And when that comes in here, and it's very close to doing so, game over. Well, we've come a long way, haven't we? And what we're going to do now then is have a, a break for, uh, say, 45 uh, minutes, and I'll come back and look at the world as it is now and what's happening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very good so far, yeah. yeah. The reason I'm here basically is to see, find out exactly what's going on in the world and uh, find out exactly what the hidden conspiracy there is that's going on yeah, today, basically. It's not just David Icke that's saying this, this stuff about the moon. There's, there's Alex Collier, uh, the Andromedan contactee, who says that the moon was towed here but from Ursa Minor, which is near the Alpha Draconis star system, by the reptilians. I don't think he's necessarily said anything that I haven't known already, but he just he's very eloquent and he's put it together in such a beautiful package that it just makes it very easy for anyone to understand. I just like the way David puts things across, you know, it, he's not afraid, he's not afraid, he's got no fear in him whatsoever, doesn't give one iota about what people think, and I think we can all learn from that, definitely. Ever since I was little, I've always thought that something was wrong. The way that society, because I believe that reality and the system that we live in are two completely different things. I've I found it very difficult to concentrate in school because I was always told what to believe. It was very structured and whenever I used to ask why, nobody could ever give me an answer. And um, it seems that David Icke seems to give those answers and opens up your perception to new possibilities. Some concepts of it I can agree with, definitely with the controlling aspect of it. Because there's got, like, when you look at the controlling thing, there's got to be a way of how they're really keeping us controlled. So I would say with that, with that aspect of it, yeah, I do agree with it. I have read and I have seen many videos, and I think he's great because there is a lot of truth in everything he says, and there will be a lot of changes from now on. I admire what he's doing. I think he's got a lot of courage to step out and enlighten a lot of people um, about what's going on in the world that the majority of us don't really understand or know about. So he's, um, I give him a thumbs up, really.